Welcome to the Homeschool Together podcast. Where one working mom and a stay-at-home dad help you navigate the nuts and bolts of the growing and dynamic world of homeschooling. With a focus on early learners. Like me! All the ins and outs of building and maintaining your homeschool life. Homeschool! Find out tips and tricks to make things like this easier. I'm reading! And ultimately, enjoy educating your kids. And what's that last thing? Have fun together! Did I do good, Daddy? (laughs) Yeah, you did, sweetie. Good job. Hello and welcome to Homeschool Together. Thanks so much for joining us. If you have a chance, head down into the show notes and please leave us a review on iTunes and check out all of our links that we have available for you to connect with us. Today we have a great interview with Ryan Billingsley from the Dad Suggests blog. Um, and he's also a fellow game schooler. Um, game school as, co-op member. For the game school co-op member. And we were really, really happy to have him. But the most important thing, and if you're listening to this and you're on our Facebook group, He's an unschooling dad, and that sparked a lot of interest in our community, and we ha- we were able to field a wide variety of questions and uh, mm-hmm. from you guys, and we were able to ask him the, today. So the interview with Ryan was just fantastic. Yeah, it was really great. It was great to get a glimpse into this. You know, you hear about unschooling, and yeah. we're not really sure. Like, I, I get what it means in theory, but I don't get what it means in practice. And I think a lot of the questions that our community had were similar, like practical questions. So we tried to ask him as many of those as we could. Mm -hmm. Um, And this gave me a great glimpse into, into what that means. And one of the things I took away from it was, you know, even if unschooling isn't what you want to do 100% of the time, there are, there are things that he talked about threads Mm -hmm. that made me want to adopt some unschooling principles within what we're doing. So maybe we're still doing some curriculum things, but we're going to let our kid have some interest led learning, um, in, uh, you know, give her time and space to, to do that and do to pursue the things that are interesting to her. I, I don't know that it has to be an all or nothing, but I, I loved his philosophy and, um, just the, the freedom that it, it gives. Mm -hmm. So, um, cautiously like it scares me to jump all in <laughs> it is a scary thing you know? and he acknowledged that and he you know we talked a lot about that with him you know the the fears that we we all have and we just came out with our fomo episode where we talk about you know a, a whole wide range of things that he doesn't even think is valid concerns right i mean right about like, like you know test scores curric- and yeah, grades scores and, and, and curriculum and, and all that stuff and doing all the things and, and it he, sounded like a much more um relaxed yes. calm pace uh and i i want to and i, and I, I want to pull some of that in yeah. and i think the key the key there that he he had he i think he articulated really well was the idea of trusting your child trusting the learning process knowing that children have in, this innate ability to learn and, and 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 interest in learning and interest in learning and being that facilitator and being that guide um, I mixed a lot of metaphors in this uh, in this <laughs> interview, and 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 I apologize for that. No, I don't. No, I don't. I love mixing metaphors. I'm like a witch's brew of metaphors. Uh, but anyway, it it was a it was a really good talk because a lot of times, um, it's hard to understand how to do unschooling, and I think he he gave some really good examples. He he talked a lot about his you know the day to day and what they do, and I think it can give you a window into that world. I think for as what you said, for a lot of people, it may not be something they can go one hundred percent into. But like with all homeschooling, there's a lot of different types of ways to homeschooling mm-hmm. homeschool, and I think when we all settle onto it, we all pick a little bit from everything. Mm-hmm. And I think unschooling is one of those things that we can adopt into our homeschool environment while also doing a math curriculum and a reading curriculum. Um, yeah. but, but understanding the the principles and the values and trying to, you know, respect it's trust and respect our learners right. and their innate abilities and, and help foster that, that love of learning. And I think that that was a good thing. And also I really liked his sole focus and he'll talk a lot about it here. We don't have to give away all the, all the secrets, but the focus on literacy reading yeah. as being the most cornerstone feature of his education of his children 
and he understands that if I can give them those basic tool sets, they, they're free to do whatever they want. Yeah. And I, I really that's like good. that focus and that, and that's, that may be one of those great little anchor points for us as homeschoolers is to really think about how, you know, where do we really need to start? And learning to read is really that starting point because once you have the ability to read, you can learn anything. Ability and love, and love of reading, reading right? Yes. That we don't push so hard that they don't enjoy reading because exactly. then that, that closes so many doors. Yeah, I think it's interesting for families that, you know, maybe this can this speaks to you and you can connect and, and bring some of these unschooling principles into your house. Or maybe you've been wanting to take the plunge and become an unschooler and <laughs> this will give you what you need. So we hope that you enjoy this great interview with Ryan. Hi, Ryan. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. This, I'm really excited to be here. Well, we're excited to have you, and our community is definitely thrilled to talk to um, somebody who has an unschooling family. So uh, let's just get started. Can you tell us about your, your family and your history and what got you all started homeschooling? Yeah, so our son went to preschool, and then he went to a, a private kindergarten. And that was at the same school that the preschool was at. And we stayed there because his teacher was moving up to kindergarten and we really liked her a lot. Hmm. And then during that year, it was a great year. And kindergarten at, at this particular school worked out really well because they still let kids be kids. And there was lots of things like costumes in, in the classroom and a big, a big area between the two kindergartens with lots of things like blocks and lots of times to just play and lots of recess time. And you know what I mean? Uh, Letting kids be kids. And then his, his, I guess his math skills were above kindergarten level. So he spent some of his time going to the first grade classroom to work, Mm -hmm. to work on his math. And he really didn't like doing that. And I think the reason is because it was such a different environment all of a sudden from kindergarten. I think the teacher was a little grumpier. I think, I think the, I think the kids were taking things a little more serious. I think kids were sitting in desks all of a sudden. And, and that was a little glimpse of what the future held. And I noticed it too. I think just walking through the hallways, seeing the first grade classroom and the second grade classroom and, it's a very stark contrast and a quick change from from doing dress up and having a costume corner to sitting in your own personalized individual desk with the teacher lecturing in front of you really mm-hmm. quick. Mm-hmm. So that's one thing that tempted us into experimenting with with more homeschooling that next year. And, mm-hmm. and this was shortly before the pandemic. We asked this school, if we could do what I heard others, what what we actually did at the school I was teaching at, we asked if we could come to school Mm part-time because I I was a chess teacher that had homeschool kids come to school only to take my chess class. And I thought that was really cool. Some kids came only for PE. Some kids were coming from homeschooling to join chess. And I, so I asked uh, the school my son was going to, if we could do something like that and just come for PE, maybe science, if, if there was something interesting going on, like experiments. I, I, I really like the idea of this almost piecemeal approach to going to the classes that you're interested in. And we couldn't get them to bite on that. And we couldn't get the public school to even really respond to it, even though I, I'm pretty sure it's kind of a requirement here because, you know, like, <laughs> You, you know, yeah, you know, uh, kids are allowed to join their sports teams, right? And yes, yes. Or if they, and I'm, I think it might go state by state, but generally speaking, I think they're supposed to allow you to do that, but we couldn't get them to respond. So we started homeschooling and then the pandemic hit following year. So we just kept homeschooling. <laughs> sure, <laughs> that kind of made the, that kind of made the decision for us. And so when you guys decided to homeschool, did you have to do research or was this something you were already familiar with as an, as a, a schooling option, or did it take you guys, you know, a lot of research and, and to find the right method and, and curriculums and things of that nature? We did a little bit of research okay. uh, to make sure that we were following the rules, obviously, see what in, in Arkansas, what we're required to do, how to sign up, how to, how to 
tell the state that we're going to homeschool. That's that's the first thing we looked up. And the good news is that Arkansas does not require very much. So in that sense, we are very lucky. Really, it's kind of just like sending in a paper that says we're homeschooling. And that's that's pretty much it. I know that other states, it's a lot more of a headache. Yeah, absolutely. There's a number of states we I think we've reviewed on our uh, earlier podcast where it is very intensive. And Fortunately, we're, we're out here in Washington. We actually have a, a fairly easy regime as well. Um, so it's been, it's been a welcome thing for us. Um, so you've chosen to unschool. Have you decided right. that for both children? Um, you had your older that you decided to homeschool. Right. Did you just naturally bring your, the younger uh, child in as well? And what, why did you choose home, unschooling as opposed to a traditional, more traditional homeschooling approach? So we didn't necessarily, this is what I would, how I would describe it. We didn't see unschooling in a book and say, that's what we're going to do. We're, we're unschoolers now. Okay. Uh, our, our kids are eight and five. And I think ideally we really like that preschool and kindergarten teacher. And, and if, if things worked out differently with the pandemic, our, our daughter, our five-year-old probably would have taken the same path as our son and then coming and the, with preschool and kindergarten. But we are, but they are both being unschooled at the moment, which is a, a great term, a funny term. But we didn't choose it as a philosophy necessary, necessarily. I think more accurately, we basically saw that what we're doing is similar to unschooling, and we said, "Oh, I guess, I guess that's what we're doing." <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was a natural, a natural way that you approached homeschooling. Exactly. And I think it was, and the reason we approached it that way, and the reason I'm personally kind of drawn towards the philosophy is because of my experience as a teacher in education as well, and my grumpiness towards standards, and my grumpiness towards the obsession with the, with the state testing yeah, mm. I, I believe a lot of homeschooling families have that, that natural allergy. <laughs> to, to that it's true. <laughs> exactly. One size fits all solution. So you, you didn't specifically pull the unschooling book off the shelf, read the proper right. definition and said, let's do that. Um, right. How would you define as somebody who kind of worked themselves into unschooling? How would you define unschooling to, you know, the, the homeschoolers that are listening right now? I think if there was an unschooling book on the shelf, it would be empty. <laughs> you'd, you'd, you'd pull the book on the shelf and you'd open it up and, and it would be just full of blank pages as kind of an artistic statement. <laughs> <laughs> so I would, I would describe unschool. It's an interesting, funny term, isn't it? I love it. It is. Yeah. It, it, it's to me, it seemed whoever named it, it seems to be suggesting some sort of deprogramming, doesn't it? Like, like mm -hmm. you've been brainwashed and now you've been, you, you need to be unschooled to, to get you over your, your, your brainwashing. That's what, well, it, that's what it, it seems like it's suggesting. Well, it, I think it goes hand in hand with the idea of de-schooling when you are leaving the public school and going to homeschooling, right. there's a term of detoxing, you know, detoxing from the school. <laughs> yeah, I think it's almost uns, unschooling is almost like a pejorative where they've said, here's the terrible word schooling. Right. I'm doing, exactly. the, I'm doing the opposite of that. <laughs> exactly. That seems to be the, the, the obvious suggestion, doesn't it? <laughs> so, it's so it makes me laugh. I, I, the way I would, in practice, I would define it as peeling back the layers of all the things I don't like about school. That's, that's what I would say personally. I don't know what the official definition or how close we fit the official definition is, but things like the standards, stripping away the standards, stripping away structure, stripping away expectations, I think might be the main thing. Hmm. The fear hmm. of doing things the right way, or I, I have to do this, stripping away the, the structure of time and the structure of curriculum and the expectations comparing comparing yourself to other people that are your same age, just because you're the same age. That that's generally how I define it in my mind. But in, and, you know, a lot of the fears that a lot of homeschoolers have are all the things you're saying, take away, you know, they're afraid of, am I doing enough? Am right. I choosing the right curriculum? Am I meeting the standards correctly? 
you know, am I a terrible teacher? Um, how, how do you take what are generally the, the herd of, of homeschoolers and the fears that we all have? How do you manage running in the opposite direction and finding success in that, in that way? I think it takes a special, is it trust? Trusting in your kids is trusting in that they're going to be okay is, is a really interesting way to put it. Yeah, that, that's, that's how I, I that's, that's how big. I've always, that's how I've always approached it. I mean, I'm, I'm one of yeah. those people that like, I want to unschool, but I'm terrified of doing it. <laughs> yeah, trust, that, <laughs> that's like, a, that's a beautiful word for it. Yeah, like I, I, like, how do you, how do you trust the process? and, and ignore the fears. I mean, maybe since you live in Arkansas, you don't have a lot of regulations. Maybe that, that helps a little bit, but yeah, you know, that definitely go, helps going in and allowing, you know, the learners to lead the education is a kind of a terrifying prospect for a lot of us. So, so here's my philosophy and this is what helps. It takes, it takes letting go. Absolutely. It takes all those things that I want, that I personally want to strip away from school, but it boils down to this is my this is my personal philosophy. I believe that if you can read and that you enjoy learning, then you're set up for absolutely anything you want to do. So my philosophy regarding being set up to learn anything you want to do is based on the idea that you have a good relationship with the learning process. And that specifically is what kind of in a sense, burned me out with the the typical public school education and private school for that matter. The the idea of the the eight the eight to three o'clock, everyone's learning the same thing. You have to have science for an hour and social studies for an hour and math for an hour and recess for ten minutes. <laughs> the what it, I, I saw it with my own eyes and it makes me sad every time I think about it is that kids fall out of love with learning. And so personally, that, that, got, that, could, that could be a reason you choose homeschooling in general, just to strip away some of that structure and to have more outside time. But for me, it's why we gravitated towards unschooling in particular, because I, I deeply believe that if you have a good relationship with the learning process, mm -hmm. you don't need to have anyone forcing you to do anything. You will gravitate towards things you are interested in and you enjoy learning. So as long as you take care of that, that key spark when they're young, that, 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 that interest, help them spark their interests in just learning about new things and chasing their passions. Uh, and I love the key on that word, uh, the process. I think a lot of homeschooling families, when they hear about unschooling, they have the mentality of, I have a curriculum. I've got to do these 50 things in the next five days. And I've got to read these books and I've got to finish these lessons and I'm not projecting my experience onto that question in the slightest. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it absolutely is me. Um, but the idea of the process is I think the, the scariest thing when it comes to unschooling, you know, mm -hmm. we all want to, I, I, I would love to hear about the nuts and bolts. And I know unschooling it's, it's more of like um, an art form in, in, in some respects I've heard it described but how, how do you go about the day-to-day? -day? How do you find those interests? How do you guide the learner? Is it, you know, you doing research and getting books and, 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 and help running with them almost like a, um, like a squire to the night? Or are you, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or are you, good. or are you the, the big draft horse pulling the cart and they're telling you where to go? Like, how does, how does it work on a day-to-day -day basis on the nuts and bolts of, you know, doing the unschooling? Those, those are two great examples, by the way. I think it's a little bit of both. I think it's a little bit of both because my wife and I bring our interest to the table every day. And we also, if our, if our kids um, show their interest in anything, we definitely run with it. I think that's, that's probably the most important thing. So day to day, there's absolutely no telling what we're going to do. <laughs> there's I, literally no structure, but that doesn't mean there's no structure to, to the family that mm -hmm. reminds me of common concerns, right? It reminds me of yep. Yep. what, what, what are people afraid of when they think of unschooling? I think maybe they're afraid of 
something along the lines of just removing school entirely and giving a kid free reign and they'll play video games all day long and turn into a spoiled bread or something along those lines. And that's what unschooling is, yeah. but <laughs> right. Yep, that, <laughs> well, we don't see them. Right. That's the, you won't see them. You won't see them for 12 hours and they'll, they'll, they'll be rude all of a sudden, but that, but it's, it's not the case because you're still their parents and they you can, I mean, you can still eat three meals a day together and you can still go <laughs> on walks and you can still have gymnastics and dance and there's, but when it comes to the the arena of what your eight hours at school used to entail, you just simply almost I just it doesn't sound it doesn't sound exactly right, but I almost want to say you just want to toss it out the window. You just and that's that's a little bit of my personal opinion is that a lot of it just doesn't really matter, and it's it sounds harsh, but when it when it when it comes down to it so much of what kids learn is just rote memorization Mm -hmm. that could be that could be done at any time of life if they're interested in it but But, does your your, yeah no it's okay does your day start with a family team stand up where you ask your five-year-old and your eight-year-old hey guys what do you want to learn today like like is it is it something in that Uh, respect like no not even not even close, really. We're the okay. even less, even even less structure than that. Okay, so so, but to get into what they might learn, it's not every day. Okay. So that's probably a big thing. We don't ask them every morning, "What do you want to learn today?" Because there's some days where they won't learn anything, at least by the standard definition of learning. They won't study anything. There's, I I personally feel there's learning going on on all the time especially because books are such a big part of our household. Okay. We've, we've read to the kids so much. My wife read to, since the, the day they were born, it's something along the lines of probably a stack of 10 to 20 books every single night for their entire life. Hmm. And they're through, through the power of osmosis and our love for books, they also love reading still. And mm-hmm. it seems like our, our son luckily latched on to that skill pretty pretty effortlessly and i credit the the osmosis of being around books for so much (laughs) so during a normal day they our kids could very well just do whatever they want um within reason they're just they're just kids and what i mean is we will play games to get we'll play board games we'll go on walks but they'll also they'll watch TV and they'll play they'll play video games or they'll play with their toys in their room or they'll go find friends in the neighborhood. We don't have a set structure any day. We don't say today we're going to do math for an hour. What we do do is if our if our kids express interest in something, we will help them hunt down any resource they could ever possibly need. For for example, our son recently chose Japanese as something that he was really interested in. In the past, he's also r- taken a deep dive with just simply a uh, simply drawing. So in both those cases, we hunted down resources. We looked up online courses, things we could sign him up for with a tutor, uh, books we can buy, and just help him pursue his interest. And when something like that happens, he might be doing it for hours during the day. And I personally feel that that's the type of learning that is memorable and will always mean more to the kids. At least I hope so. With following their interests, there's this competition a little bit between the things that they want to do. And then there's the things that we also need them to do, right? Like I, I, I need to get my child reading. I need to get my child uh, doing math, right? There's, there's some basic things. How do you, how do you tackle it when there's something that you know that they need to do that they might be a little reluctant to, to pursue and, and to show interest in? How, how do you, how do you manage that? So I think, first of all, I think my, my personal definition of need is probably probably starts out a lot different and but I do agree with the 
reading, definitely. I mentioned that before. So for example, uh, with with our son in particular, and our, and our daughter is at the stage where she's just uh, working on easy readers and beginning uh, to move into independent reading. Uh, but our eight-year-old is cruising along independently reading. A lot of it happened through, like I said, osmosis and the exposure to the written word and looking at it while his parents were reading and getting getting the cadence and things like that that way and but also i have this this working theory where when kids are younger and i'm interested if you if you think the same thing there's almost this built-in hunger to learn and almost all kids i've ever met Mm -hmm. as long as you don't um beat it out of them through through bad experiences with with learning it seems like as long as that curiosity is nurtured kids are pretty hungry to learn and i think you have to take advantage of that that time to to work on things there i mean there's there's so many good resources out there that we actually that we we did use with our kids just the I, I think they're called Bob books, things like easier reader things, mm-hmm. things like things like Brain Quest and things like that, and things that are designed to work on your your letters mm-hmm. and and all the the early reading types of things. And we never had from our kids at least we never had any pushback at all when we were, when we work on things like that. And as they're getting older, especially with our son, with our daughter, like I said, we're still. We still we still use some of those early readers and some of those fun resources. And with our son, he's I suppose we moved to a different stage where we might have I might introduce him to some suggestions, things, just resources I've seen before. Mm-hmm. And if he runs with it, then that's great. But if he doesn't, I I never say, okay, now you have to do an hour of that website I showed you. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 a lot of times interestingly enough he does run with it just just as another example like for math there's you know there's uh, Khan Academy is a great mm-hmm. one yeah. um but then there's for younger kids just learning things like math facts there's there's a website that he uses that it's just like you're playing games and you're just it's pretty it's pretty repetitive but kids really like it and I said hey there's this game that kids in math class at my school used to use you I'll show it to you and he'll log into it and some and nowadays he might log into it like once a month but when he does he'll do it for like an hour and and that's generally how I introduce things to him now and with when it so so back to your question uh, that uh, that's a long-winded way of saying we were aware of certain things that that we think um, would be useful in their lives, especially reading. And if, if let's say, for example, we were talking about a struggling reader, I would definitely, if it was our, if, if one of our kids was a struggling reader, I would definitely put emphasis on that. And by, by, inter, by introducing them to resources and working, working in, in, a, in such a way that I, I felt like we're, we're tackling, we're tackling this we're tackling this, uh, this goal together, but after, but once, because my definition of what they need is a little bit differently. It's one, once we reach that very specific goal of being an independent reader, then I would immediately step back and say, okay, we've, that's, that's specifically my main goal. Now I just want you to love learning. Do, do you have, you know, keen in off of your, this idea of as long as we keep positive experiences open to you know learning whatever they want Mm -hmm. do you see that the the trust aspect that you're building that kind of those bridges with your learner allowing them to have that freedom and the enjoyment do you find it's easier to introduce like as you said introduce other resources and then they trust that hey dad you know this is my dad he's he's really good at you know showing me good things i'm going to run with this because he thinks it's important is that a way for you to get learning in certain areas that, or to introduce them to new things that you know might help benefit them going forward? Do you see the, that bridge building as like a key thing in the unschooling education? Yeah, that's a that's a really good theory. I like the way you said that. That I think I think that's absolutely true. Okay. Um, if you because what I because what we don't do is 
is push busy work down their throat. And I, I, I tend to agree with you that that would break trust, not just with the teacher, the parent, Mm -hmm. but also with the entire process of learning. It's so I think, I think you're onto something there. Well, and I've, I've known because I do most, you know, I do most of the homeschooling in our, in our household for, we have a six-year-old, almost six-year-old. Um, and I've had those moments where, you know, I'm doing more of a traditional homeschooling environment where I, as the educator, um, have made those mistakes where, you know, I push too hard or I create a negative experience. And I do see, you know, the eyes and the doors shutting and I have to back mm. off and say, oh, I made a mistake there. And I should approach this differently next time. I, I really f- like I, I I really feel that, and I've tried, you know, as a novice amateur educator, trying to be better going forward and keeping those doors and the bridges, the bridge building as a as a positive experience as opposed to creating negative experiences. How do you, you know, you have experience as an educator? Are there any skills mm-hmm. that new homeschooling parents can can think about and and things that you can help impart on new educators like you know myself or other new homeschooling families? I think the most important skill that I've ever acquired from teaching, and I wouldn't even say that I've mastered this skill, but that I've learned is important and I do my very best to do with students and my own kids and makes a lot of sense to me is that the relationship is the entire key to the process. And what I mean is kids need to feel safe. Kids need to feel engaged and kids will behave better, which isn't the most important thing in the world for this conversation, but, (laughs) but, but it's true. If you for for our teachers and out there that obviously if you have a good relationship with the students, you'll get so much more out of them, not just academically, but, but behavior wise, if you say, take it to the homeschool environment, it reminds me of the trust bridge that you were talking about. If you have a negative environment based on things like discipline or things like strict expectations or boring work or whatever it is, if, if something about this environment becomes at all unpleasant, if it's something you don't look forward to, then it really is counterproductive, in my opinion, for the entire education process. It becomes a job, maybe even in the best case scenario. In the worst case scenario, it becomes like jail. <laughs> All right. And kids feel like they're forced to go to this place every day. And I suppose you could fall into the same trap homeschooling if you had a eight to three schedule and it was something that a kid didn't look forward to, then then it's then it's a job all of a sudden. And and that's that's I don't think person I just don't think I could be wrong, but I don't think it's the best approach mm-hmm. to education to to make kids think that it's simply their responsibility. It's a lot to put on a young child, that's for sure. Yeah, exactly. Right. So in your in your house you you talked about this kind of myth that there's no discipline, there's no routine uh, with unschoolers. Can you talk a little bit does your family have any even loose routines that you follow day to day that you know, you kind of the way that you, your your whole life kind of works for the week, or is it just totally uh, free for all each day with whatever they want to get up to? We have a loose structure is a good way to put it with our day to day. Simple things like like when we usually wake up, when we usually eat, when we brush our teeth at night, and then we read a bunch of books together. Those kinds of things, uh, or you know, pre pandemic days when we have ninja class or gymnastics or dance and those kinds of things. But when it comes to any, any kind of specific um, thing that we're going to learn, definitely no structure unless we've signed up for something, unless we've signed up for some sort of an online course where there's going to be a teacher on zoom 
then we know we have to be there at Wednesday at two o'clock or whatever, whenever the class is. But but there's there's nothing that's the same every day for for the learning. Um, I had a question regarding your involvement, like you and your wife's involvement, or you and your spouse regarding engaging with them. Do you find that you spend a lot of time, you know, whatever the activity they're in, say they're in a deep play in Legos, do you find yourself there working with them all the time? Or if they, you know, your son said, you said your son was in the Japanese, are you right next to him, you know, learning Japanese words or drawing or whatever? Are you doing these activities with them or are you stepped back and just kind of observing from a distance? That's a really great point. And the answer is we're there all the time. Um, both of us are lucky enough to be at home all the time. And I, I, I work from home and we, we spend lots of time together in the house. <laughs> and when, so for example, uh, the Japanese example, when it's something, when it's something like that, like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm like, I wanna learn that too. That sounds fun. So we're, so we're doing the apps together. And when it, something like Legos, when we get a new set, we do put it together, um, together, together. <laughs> <laughs> and, but they also have, they also have time alone in their own interests or playing with toys or playing together. They're actually, we're lucky for, uh, usually they they get along pretty well together too. <laughs> yeah. And, and that reminded me of another interesting point, which is, something like video games or watching TV, there's a, there's a big stigma attached to that. And which I don't entirely subscribe to because I'm a big fan of those things too. But, <laughs> but, um, but I do find that enjoying them together is a lot more fun and maybe definitely certainly more social. I think it's, 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 and even personally, I, I find it a better experience for me if I'm sharing a movie with someone else. So I like bonding. We bond that way a lot together, playing games together, board games, video games, watching a movie together. We do, we spend quite a bit of time together. Yes. <laughs> so, so with respect to um, doing things together and your, your drive for that literacy ask, you know, getting them literate reading mm -hmm. um, actively one of the theories that Ariel and I have always talked about is that we never want to stop reading to our kids. Now that your son is a, yeah. a, a reader, do you find you're pulling, you know, sci-fi books off the shelf and reading to him more complex? Are you always trying to lift him up on the books that you're reading to him or do you not read to him? Or do you like let him read to you? What, what is the dynamic there and how do you pull? No, I don't want to say pull because I, I know the answer in the unschooling mentality, but are you, <laughs> are you actively trying to engage active literacy by reading to him more complex books? And I'm not saying you're pulling Joyce off the shelf for your eight-year-old, but <laughs> you know, are, you, are you, are you doing I know what like you that? mean. Yeah. I, oh. um, I don't choose books for a reason other than I want to share them with okay. my son. So that's, that's what I mean is I don't choose the book because it's more complex because I think I specifically think he, it's going to give him new vocab. I, okay. That mostly just happens naturally because I have a, a lot of books I want to share with them. And, and, and by the way, I, I have the same goal. My wife and I have the same goal, which is great. I, I, I never want to stop reading to our kids either. Okay, cool. <laughs> and and so I have lots of books from my childhood and from from being uh, and when I was a teenager that that I fell in love with that that I want to share with my kids too. So you know the the classics like Lord of the Rings and things like that. So when they're really young, it's like it's just way too many characters, right? <laughs> it's just, it's yeah. too it's 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 too long winded and too many characters and plot lines to keep up with and if I read it to them too early, they'd probably be put off it forever. So, so <laughs> when I'm choosing, when I'm choosing the books, I'm going to read to them. I don't say, okay, I'm, I'm going to push them. And with this more complex book, I say, oh, I think he's ready for this book. Now. I, I think he's just has the right attention span for this book. Now. And finally I get to share this book with them. 
so you're you're actively reading, you're doing lots of things together, but you said also that there's independent time that they have. How important do you think it is to foster our kids' ability to both work independently and pursue their own interests independently? I feel like sometimes that we do so much instruction with our daughter that we're almost a little bit of a crutch. Like if she wants to build a fort or do something imaginative, sometimes she struggles in that she wants us to kind of do it for her. So I wonder what your thoughts are about like the, the balance of togetherness versus independence. Well, and I'll put a little corollary on there and the right to be bored. How does boredom factor into that as well? Like the using boredom as a, oh, yeah. as a, as a, as a, a motivator. Of, Matt's to, like the cruise director every day. Yeah. He feels like he has to like oh, come up with a new, like exciting activity every minute. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, no, so no, I have a two-year-old that tells me, what are we doing next daddy? No, but, be, yeah. but our five-year-old asks the, the same question says, too, is like, wants us to always be on and always entertain. So uh, we're, we're going to stop talking funny. now. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> That's fun. Our five-year-old does the same thing. She really <laughs> She really wants to know what's next and, or, or what are we going to do tomorrow? And let's, and what's, what's the whole agenda for tomorrow? Well, we're going to wake up <laughs> and, then, and then we're going to, then we're going to, we're going to go get the groceries. And she's really, she really wants to know everything. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> but so I, I think boredom is good. And I think it's something not to get, not to go off on too big of a tangent, but I do think it's something that's lost. Yep. And I think it's, it's, it just kind of, just it starts to go to go down that rabbit hole of the technology conversation like like when we were young mm-hmm. if we wanted to watch our favorite show we had to wait a whole week right <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> and so it's that instant gratification of binge watching shows or there's always something entertaining available at your fingertips so for that i think the only real solution is going on a camping trip and getting outside and because I think it really is. And those, those moments are important. And we, we just got back. We just, we just got ourselves our first ever old used beat up RV that we're, we've dragged around to a few camping trips recently. So we're, we're joining the RV culture and I think it's fun to get them out, to get them out there. And that's always been important to me too, the forest bathing. What was what was the example that you gave during your during your your question area? Like um you know uh, when our daughter would you know wants to build a fort or something yeah. she's she has she has a lot of cardboard creations she wants to make lately she wants us to like do everything for her because you know we do a lot of things with her so uh, the, things like that where you know she or, can or go out play, and do it or her play requires you to do some assembly or or be the, you know, hold this lamp, dad, I need to do this thing, you know, like, like, how how do you get them to engage with their imagination by themselves? Like, we have kind of, and I know you might cringe, but we kind of have forced quiet time, in some respects, Mm -hmm. to kind of try to cultivate Ah. her interests for an hour or two, you know, whether it's an audiobook or Legos, we take the thing that she's most interested in, we let her kind of play alone. And we, we see that to be helping with a little bit of her independent play and kind of cultivating that. Do you guys do anything like that or Ooh, without, like the force, that. without the forcing? <laughs> That's, I, I, like the, I like that concept. We, so here's, we don't, we don't do anything like that. We don't, we don't do forced quiet time. We don't even, now this, this might sound scary, but we don't, we very rarely say, well, there's no rhyme or reason to it. We very rarely say no TV today. Um, so unless, unless, I mean, there's always exceptions unless it becomes some sort of a, some sort of an issue or obviously if we're about to go somewhere, but I like this concept of any time that you can help them discover their inner thoughts. And I'm, I'm no expert on this by any means. It reminds me of, the idea of forest bathing it reminds me of the concept of what's it called when you are centering yourself right mm-hmm. the, the the kind of meditating and 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 listening to your quieting your inner thoughts because mm-hmm. there's so much stimulation going on all the time especially in this technology everywhere but what when you described the forced quiet time go entertain yourselves that's 
in theory, I think a really, I think that's a really solid plan. I like that a lot. And our, in our case, it's really um, part of the quiet time part of it is because we have a baby that's sleeping. So, you yeah, know, she's not, uh-huh. thou, thou shalt right. not like the monster, yeah. but yeah. Um, you know, even after she na- doesn't nap anymore, I think that there's something about, there's something about, you know, our, our kids are waiting because we do have plans. We do have curriculum. Yeah. We have things we're doing with them and, right. and they're kind of always looking to Matt and going, okay, what's next? What are we doing next? What are we doing next? At some point, that can burn him out too. And oh, for his own yeah. self-care too, it's, and, and to, to push them and make them feel more comfortable. You know, now is a time where I want you to go and play by yourselves. In this case, you have yeah. to be quiet because your sister's sleeping, but otherwise go and do something that's a, by yourself. <laughs> that's a fine thing to say. <laughs> I don't think there's, there's nothing wrong with saying that at all. I think fine thing to say self-care is important. Well, awesome. Uh, so you, you talked a little bit about playing games. Um, do you subscribe to game schooling? Do you incorporate games as a as a general activity? Do you, you have you know? Do you like to p- pull games off the wall and play with them and see if that sparks any interest? Do you, or do you use games to help develop new interests? We we do play a lot of games. I don't think I would. I think unschooling is a better descriptor for us than than game schooling, but we do play a lot of games and I think this, this fits in with, with the philosophy of we have lots of learning by osmosis. So it's just another one of the things that we do where there's definitely learning taking place, math, right? Just at just simple games that have points, anything, anything that has points. So there's math, there's literacy, there's great imagination and storytelling oftentimes because we would like to play games that are heavy on just themes and so we don't choose games. What, what we don't do is we don't choose games because we want to teach something. So it, it would be definitely incorrect, I suppose, to call ourselves game schoolers. And so we, we, don't, we don't choose the board games we play because they fit in with our curriculum. But I, we do love playing games a lot. Do you find that to be something that, that they play together now or that do you see them pulling games off just as in their own interests? Have you been able to see that? They grab games that they want to play all the time, but they okay. usually bring them to us. They want us to play with them too. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. I, I think at this yeah. time, I, I, it's reasonable. Yeah. It's yeah. True. I think so too. Yeah. I think it's, it's interesting. Uh, you know, you're talking about playing games and you read a lot of books to them and then they have their own interests and there is time when they, they do maybe TV or video games, but they could also be logging onto that math website. How would you, you know, it, some of our listeners are in states where they have to, you know, report on what they do, or they have to have like a certain number of, for us, we have to have a certain number of hours of learning per year. Like <laughs> if you, if you had to quantify it and you're in one of those type of states, like what would your advice be to those folks is, is unschooling just totally not for them or you know, if you had to take an accounting of the actual learning that's happening through all of these various means, how would you, how would you go about that? That that's a tricky one. I would say from your, well, maybe, maybe you could, you'd be better suited to answer this. Can you just lie? <laughs> can, can you yes. just lie? Yes. Thank, yes. Thank you. <laughs> I, mean, I, mean, I mean, I, I, honestly, that's what I would do. It, I would recommend black, it. The but, black helicopters are coming. You know, right. we did a we did an episode <laughs> I, on the podcast um called "Am I Doing Enough?" and we looked at like every ten minutes of a public school day, and then we looked at what we did at homeschool, and and we actually just watched our kid for a day, and then realized just how much learning was taking place. I, I wonder if it yeah. might be something like that, where rather than um, logging every second, you yeah. do mm-hmm. take a few days and and really watch and, and be observant. And then maybe you average that out and say, yeah, these yeah. are typical type of days. And gosh, we got four hours of learning in today between the kids playing games and us reading to the kids and yeah. him doing his online math thing and doing this other thing right. he was interested in. And maybe that's the kind of answer that I I don't know any other way to do it. Oh yeah, absolutely. So I think there's two things. I think first of all, whether you're unschooling or following a curriculum or game schooling, I mean, there's absolutely learning taking place. That's first and foremost, all on all sorts of facets of life. And so, and the other thing is what does the state want 
on their paperwork to appease them mm-hmm. and and how much work are you willing to put in to impress the state or so I don't know what's the point what's the I mean like yeah so <laughs> yeah. I would if it was if it was me I would say yeah, yeah I know my kids are learning all sorts of stuff and they're going to turn out great and but I need to I need to fill out this paperwork so because for the state so I'm just going to fill it out anyway I, that, that's what that sounds ter- like <laughs> yeah. terrible advice but that's what I would have that's probably what I would have done I would have just just it's almost reminds me of what school is like like this is what I have to do I'm just going to type it up until it's done and now I I did I did my requirement (laughs) it's it's really hard you know it's like you've got to follow the rules because we want to keep homeschooling legal of course if we we don't follow the rules then they might take it away from us right so (laughs) that's true my advice is terrible (laughs) (laughs) no no but it but it's a hard thing to do if your learning is more free form how do you how do you put together if you're in a state that needs a portfolio how do you put yeah. together a portfolio? I mean, I guess it's everything that your kids were interested in and you gobble up all of those pieces of artwork and, yeah. you know, other things it's, and yeah, put it together. It's, it's similar to what teachers have to do when they're being observed or they're oh. all the type, the types of things teachers have to collect oftentimes is put together a portfolio with examples of your students' work. So yeah, take, take pictures of every single thing, every picture they draw, right? Take, yeah, take right. pictures, take pictures of every program they pull up on their computer and file it away. Well, and, and you've talked about this, um, Ariel, in the past of the reverse planning, right? where you actually, you know, whatever you end up doing, you then put that down as your, your schedule of what you did. Right. 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 So you, at the end of the yeah. day, you could be like, oh yeah, he did, did an hour of this yeah. and we did an hour of reading and we did this and you write it down at the end of Even the day. Even just a short and... journal. I, mm-hmm. maybe, yeah. maybe building off of Ariel's question um, and the fact that you have additional homeschooling families that you talk to, um, I'm going to ask you the dreaded question of, uh, that's, this is all great, Ryan, this is great, but I need to get my kid into college. <laughs> How are they going to apply to college when, yeah. when, when you don't have any Ooh. structured stuff? How do you do that? That's, or like you, your, yeah. your friend said they had a 13 year old, they're a little bit closer to that point. How, what are right. they doing? What are they planning for? How do they handle that? So that, that question is like a whole nother bag of worms, right? Or, or does the College of the Ozarks have an onboarding program for right. uh, unschoolers? <laughs> so first of all, I guess maybe interesting thing to mention, I'm sure you've seen is statements from places like Harvard, where they say that homeschooling is actually considered a pro now, a benefit. Like this is yeah, something that's awesome. This is, this, is, this is something that attracts us to kids now. Yeah. <laughs> so, but... On the flip side, I also have to mention the same breath is, which is very true to form is I don't care. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I just don't care. I don't think every kid needs to go to college. It's true. And that's not what every parent wants to hear. Um, I think there's so many more routes out there to a happy life. And this, this whole obsession with doing well on the test every year and making it to the next step and then go into college just because it's the next step and then getting a master's and then getting a doctorate and then becoming a college professor. It's not what everyone needs. <laughs> it's there's, there's so many more paths to success. There's so many more paths to happiness. So the way I approach that question before, before after offering practical advice is I always say, I always have to start with that. It's, it's, but also, if you do have that, that goal of going to college, or maybe more important, if your kids have that goal, mm-hmm. then it's definitely not impossible, right? So I think, and I 100% believe, like I said before, if they can read, and if they like to learn, absolutely everything is possible, not just in life, but in, in academia, Mm -hmm. And just because on the first grade standards, it says you need to do so-and-so math by the first grade, or you need to have your, your multiplication facts memorized by the third grade, or you need to know what a gerund is in the eighth grade or whatever, just, just because it says that doesn't mean you can't learn it when you're in ninth grade. (laughs) Doesn't mean 
if, yeah. if a kid if a kid can read and they enjoy learning and they say hey i want to go to college and you hand them a textbook they can learn at any yeah. age so that that i think that's important to remember and yeah. if if it becomes their goal and they're self-motivated um then the sky's the limit still you can sign up for online courses at any point and throw throw the world at them and if that's what they want then it's never too late i mean if you you can learn social third grade social studies when you're 20 right yeah. if you if you didn't learn about christopher columbus when in in elementary school like you were supposed to then you can easily pick up uh, an entire biography of christopher columbus when you're 20 years old and read it and now you know <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think it, I think it's interesting. Sometimes we think about everything as having like, I have to take this step. If I don't take this step, then my kid's going to be barred from this next step. I I see all this all the time. Questions come up on Facebook groups. You know, should I teach my kids printing or cursive? And a bunch of people say, well, you have to teach them cursive because all of our great documents are written in cursive. They have to be able to read the Constitution. And I'm always like, it doesn't matter if I can write in cursive. I can still learn to read cursive. But right. In our brain. A lot of us are thinking like, well, those people knew how to write in cursive and then that's how they wrote. So if I want to read it, I have to be able to write, you know, yeah. it's all those prerequisites we give our kids, yeah. it, it also, all the steps, you it, know, it's also funny. It's, it's how, how we have this one style of education for our children. And then as mm-hmm. adults or in our corporate life or in our, you know, in our private entrepreneurial lives, we, we just approach the world as an unschooler. You know, like right now I'm doing a deep right. dive into civil war history. I just read um, exactly. McPherson's book and I'm reading a couple of Shara books and I've got good uh, Doris K- uh, Goodwin's books lined up and I'm, I'm doing a deep dive on civil war right now. I, ain't nobody telling me to do that. Exactly. And last year I had a, a whole, you know, fix on world war one and world war two. And, you know, we approach the world as adults, as unschoolers. It, there, exactly. it doesn't seem it doesn't seem crazy enough to have our children approach the same way. You well, know? right, and, and in our corporate lives too, when we want to <laughs> know something, if there's something that comes up that's right. like, I should have probably learned that. I'm going to wiki that, and yeah. then I will know it or, or five minutes boss, later. My boss says we need to do this thing. I, um, I need it by next week. I immediately go out and do a bunch of research, learn a bunch of stuff, put together a presentation, give that presentation, and nobody was there grading me there was no grade well yeah and no prerequisite knowledge may have been needed (laughs) you might have just had to figure it out I I wonder if our kids if we do too much in the way of curriculums and things if they lose the just figure it out ability yeah that Mm -hmm. you kind of need to have to be successful I think (laughs) yeah that that that, oh that 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 reminds me of of your independence question and I suppose what you're saying reminds me a lot of my son and when he wants to learn something, I suppose his independence really is being exercised because you're, you're studying history and he's taking deep dives down things like magic, like how to perform magic. And it, and he's, he's, he's interested in it and he, he checks out books on it and he watches videos on it and he uses websites like, like the Epic website Mm -hmm. to, to, to to research things that he's interested in and he'll take he'll take these deep dives down it and i really think that's what school should be like i have these if you if i if i get talking about it too much i always come back to my my theories of how to fix school and it always boil <laughs> it always boils down to we just need to give teachers more money and give or, or or all the money we're already spending on the testing. Mm-hmm. Oh my, those tests are so expensive. They are. <laughs> those yeah. those testing companies are making so much money and and on the books that you study for the test and it and on the training sessions for the teachers. Oh, it's it's gross. But if we just <laughs> if we just gave all that money to the teachers and said, "Hey, if your kids want to learn Japanese, buy them some Japanese stuff." Yeah. Let, oh, oh, that's what we need. Here's a here's a tough question, maybe to you. Who is unschooling not for? Who would you tell, you know, a family or a style of learning that maybe unschooling isn't the right thing? I think I can honestly say, if you uh, have the type of personality where it's impossible to let go, 
Um, if you really, really like structure and maybe your kids really, really like structure, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's definitely a personality type um, that you don't like the sound of the freedom, which when I say it that way, it's like, who would that be? That's impossible. <laughs> but but if you don't, if you don't like the sound of, of having days that are completely free of plans, um, I, like my wife and I are on the same page. We really like it when there's nothing on our schedule, <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's not everybody. I think, I think too, it, it's something if you like for myself, for example, it, it sounds like too easy to just let go and say, I'm just going to let them learn what they want to learn. And it's all, it's all going to work itself out. You know, they're going to, they're going to learn by osmosis, all these things. I think mm -hmm. the thing that would be really hard for me is all day watching like a hawk. Mm -hmm. What are they doing? Is that educational? Could that be, what are they learning from mm -hmm. that? You know, like, and feeling this guilt that I'm, the, that I'm taking this easy road and I'm not doing enough for them. Like I, I'm their primary I, educator. What am What am I doing? Yeah. How am I earning my keep? <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I see what you mean. I think that's part of the letting go. And I think my response to that is don't sell yourself short because being a parent is hard. <laughs> and <laughs> you do you do a lot for your kids. <laughs> it's it's uh, even if even if you aren't reading them a reading to them about Christopher Columbus <laughs> you're still their mom or your their dad and you're still you know taking them on walks and you're you're still giving them all of your love and attention and you're doing other things together and you're raising them it's it it just my inst my reaction to that worrying about the am i doing enough educationally is that it's that's tied in with all of those expectations and standards that from the beginning I just said let go of that's 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 the key for me is that's where it has to start is letting go of that that's defining defining success by these standards maybe we'll pivot off of your homeschooling family and talk a little bit about you you know tell us about you know, the dad suggests blog, what, what are you doing about books? And who are you? Who is this online blogger that we're talking to? <laughs> so I'm the, I call myself the lead father of dadsuggest.com. It's my, <laughs> my official title, lead father of dadsuggest.com. So this is a website where uh, all the articles, it's, it's a blog because it's personal personal anecdotes um, that are tied together with recommendations of specifically uh, kids books and family board games. And so a lot of the articles on the website are lists of, of picture books, like our favorite scary picture books, uh, the best picture books of the year, um, our favorite books ever. And then um, lists of family board games, like the, the best board games for three-year-olds or the, the best board games to help uh, practice your colors, those kinds of things. But also, um, I also dive into dad thoughts type things a lot too, like raising kids. So it's, it's a bit of a parenting website as well. Um, and you, you like to suggest books. You have a five-year-old, you have an eight-year-old. Do you have a best book for a five and eight-year-old for people to take away and Google and go check out from the library? Ooh, Ooh, make I you see. narrow it to one, maybe Ooh, a couple, yeah. a couple is okay. fine. Yeah. If I had to recommend picture books, I often think about which books I buy as gifts a lot. Mm -hmm. um, my number one picture book of all time is Extra Yarn by Mac Barnett and illustrated by John Clausen. I just think it's the perfect picture book. It's a lot like an old fairy tale about a girl who finds a magic box with yarn, never ending yarn. And she's um, knitting sweaters for everyone and all the animals in town. And then a, an evil archduke uh, wants to buy the box from her, but she doesn't want to sell it. And then he tries to steal it from her. It's a fantastic book and it's just beautiful too because John Clausen's one of our 
very favorite illustrators. Okay. And, okay. and, and then another, one other one that ties in with our conversation a lot is called all the ways to be smart, which I buy as a gift all the time because it's just the most brilliant concept for a picture book. That's really important for kids. And the, the, the idea of the book is that there are more than there's more than one way to be smart. And the one way they're talking about is the traditional, you did well on the test at school kind of smart. Right. Gotcha, gotcha. And so there's all the ways to be smart. So it, I think it's so important for kids to read this book. It's so beautiful. And they're saying things like um, using your imagination, you know, um, building boats from boxes and being, being nice to people and asking questions. And, and so, th so this book, I think is just a really, really good lesson for all kids that it's not just about your, how you did on the spelling test. There, there's, there's so much, basically it's saying there's so much more to life and that doesn't define you. It's a great book. That sounds great. That sounds great. Um, do you have any closing words for new homeschooling uh, homeschoolers? Maybe they're maybe they won't be doing unschooling, or maybe they'll be doing more traditional homeschooling with mm -hmm. curriculums. Do you have any advice for them? What do you wish you knew? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I would definitely want to say enjoy the time with your family. It's a, it's a beautiful and very lucky thing to be able to spend that time together, and it's it's kind of wild when you stop and think about it how long school is <laughs> it's it's kind of it's kind of wild that it really is like a job isn't it it's kind of wild that it's like eight to three and then there's an after school program and mom and dad or mom or dad um get home at five or six and then you eat dinner and then it's bedtime and it's, it's a wild thing that we do. I suppose it might not feel like it sometimes if when you're, when you're bottled up in the same house all the time and, or if, you, if you start driving each other crazy, there are probably times when you think this is, this is stressful or something along those lines. But then I encourage you to step back and say, uh, think, think about the alternative and step back and, and say, and realize how special it is to spend that much extra time with your kids when everyone um, inevitably says they grew up so fast and, and where did the time go? Inevitably, everyone says that eventually. Yeah. Um, so having just ridiculous, um, like so much more time together compared to the eight hours a day you usually lose. Mm -hmm. And so that's the one thing I would say maybe to someone who's considering it um, or just starting is that it really is, it really is a special and beautiful thing to have that time together. I think that's a great way to close it. I Thank do. you so much for your time, Ryan. This was, um, this was really fun and yeah. very interesting for us. Thank yeah, you. It, it scratched, oh, um, yeah. Scratch that unschooling niche that I, I always wanted to talk to somebody who's doing it. I've always read about it <laughs> and I've always been interested in it. And I, I try to do some of those practices in our own homeschool, but it was really nice to actually talk to you and see it in the wild for real. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. My pleasure. So that I, it's it's um i i don't i don't know obviously everyone probably says the same thing if we're doing everything right we're certain we're most certainly not doing everything right but it's fun to talk about theory together i like i really i'm interested in i'm interested in education and i i always love a good chance to talk about theory of just what could be what could be helpful yeah, I think it's important to have those discussions so we can all, you know, find the right paths for, okay. for each family. We're all so different. Well, yeah, thanks That's so exactly much. Thanks right. for staying yeah, up definitely. late with us. We appreciate yeah, it. Definitely. My pleasure. <laughs> thanks so much for joining us today and making us a part of your homeschool journey. Please engage with us on social media. Join our Homeschool Together podcast group on Facebook and find us at Homeschool Together podcast on Instagram. We'd love to hear your feedback, questions, and recommendations. 
Until next time. Happy homeschooling!